Hello, I am Jake Collins, and this is my commentary for the tenth episode of The Mummy, Secrets of the Magi, Old Friends. I've been wondering if the title is actually the best thing about this episode, because it's quite clever, but I've come to the conclusion that actually, not for the first time, the best thing about this episode is Chris Marquette, who does some absolutely brilliant deliveries, particularly later in the episode, which should rank among the best voice acting deliveries in the history of voice acting performances, in my opinion. It's not a very enticing opening, this. Two guest characters mucking about in this temple, and we don't even see that native guide after this scene. And, well, it certainly sets the standard it's going to keep up. It's not a very good episode. Rather poor overall, but slightly redeemed in the end. Four out of ten. The issue of Alex's overconfidence and recklessness builds to a crescendo here, but it's horribly overdone and makes him come across as unnecessarily unpleasant. Anuk Sunarman really can't carry an entire episode as the main villain, and of course she's after a MacGuffin. On the other hand, I find it highly stimulating to see Alex very close to the peak of his manacle and magi skills, and he does have a pretty decent extended fight with Anuk, so that squeezed an extra star out of me for this one. Yes, indeed, that's where that extra star came from. And it's true, the ending of this episode is pretty stimulating for Alex doing a fight sequence with Anuk Sanarman, and we can appreciate that in the context of the whole series, like in the previous episode, seeing Alex very close to the peak of his manacle and magi skills, ready for the season finale. Well, that's what should be the case anyway, as we'll go on to discuss very soon. It's not quite how things pan out. I've read in some places that this episode actually aired after Trio in the original US airing, but this is definitely the right order to have them in, old friends before Trio. The DVD has certainly got them in the right order. It makes sense for where we are in the story and certainly where Alex is mentally, emotionally. So yeah, this is the right order to have them in. Old Friends, and then Trio, my very favourite episode, which I've been looking forward to talking about for a long time, and which is the next episode. And here we have, to open the main body of this episode, this excruciating, cringe-worthy London sequence, where Alex is messing about on Tower Bridge to impress these three random boys. Evie calls this the London Bridge later. As a lifetime resident of London, Evie should know it's not the London Bridge. It's a bridge in London, but not the one called London Bridge. It's the one called Tower Bridge. Alex is pretty pleased with himself, showing off to impress these three. If he really wanted to impress them, all he'd have to do would be to drop his trousers. But he'd rather, of course, show off with a manacle at this stage. And this is Jasper that gets stuck on the bridge and Alex has to rescue him, which is quite a nice little rescue sequence. If you enjoy seeing Alex jumping about and doing heroics, which I do, as you know. But where's Simon? He's not here. Is it too painful for Simon to see Alex at all nowadays when Alex is back in London? Simon's just going cold turkey. And what about Jim Cummings as that London Bobby who seems to have come... 50 years forward in a time warp while chasing Jack the Ripper. I don't think that works very well. And this conversation between Alex and his parents, well, I don't like it very much because, of course, it shows Alex as very bratty and very sulky and it's not the kind of interplay I like to see between Alex, Rick and Evie. It's more like the kind of interplay you'd see in the movie The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which I don't like at all. And it does contain the bit where Evie says the London Bridge, or she should say Tower Bridge. And it also has Alex saying, I'm practically an adult. Don't treat me like a kid. And well, he is practically an adult, isn't he? Certainly in all visible ways, even if not quite yet in all mental ways. 
And this is the bit where Alex is being so sulky with his whole family on this boat here, and so horrible and so unhelpful. It's really bad and unpleasant to watch. Jonathan very kindly here translates for Rick when he wants to say year four skipping rope champion. He translates it to third grade jump rope champion, just so Rick will understand what he means. But dear, oh dear, how horrible when we've had such compelling family teamwork and family dynamics in the past to see these kind of family dynamics and lack of family teamwork and Alex being such an awful brat. It's terrible. This one is written by a one-time writer called Tony something, which is perhaps partly why it feels anomalous in many ways, but he's only doing what he's been told to do by the series overview writers, Tom and Greg. And as an episode about a rebellious teenager, it's very standard. It ticks all the right boxes. But I guess that's why it just doesn't feel like the O'Connells in particular. Quite disappointing. And here's a bit where Rick says about Alex, he's a teenager, Evie. Being rebellious is his job. And, yeah, he's a teenager. That's as specific as we're going to get, and we really should get, if the Mummy cartoon universe is going to make any sense. What do I call them in the review? Unnecessarily unpleasant, and I was saying that in the previous episode commentary as well. And yeah, that's what he is. Sulky, bratty, unnecessarily unpleasant. Not really Alex, as I say, out of character for Alex. Fine if he's still got a lesson to learn about growing up. I'd be absolutely fine with that, I'd enjoy watching that. But I want to see him do it as Alex O'Connell. Not as general, bratty, rebellious teenager. I was watching this part of the episode and thinking to myself, why did I give this four stars rather than three? And as I've said in the review there, it is because of the end. It does pick up at the end with Alex and his fight with Anouk, and as I said before, it's where Chris does all his really excellent voice work in this episode. So the first half is pretty poor and easy to switch off mentally during. Here's where Evie says that Jane, who's been aged by a nook, as we know, is supposed to be my age. And, well, you must be cracking on a bit by now, Evie. I mean, if you think about it, she's got to be knocking 40 at least, and so is Rick. So perhaps it's not quite so incredible that Jane is her age, being all old and grey and wrinkly. I mean that only in jest, of course. But it's true that Rick and Evie must be getting on by now. Alex is far too short in that shot. Again, he barely comes up to Jonathan's shoulder. When they were outside the temple, he was as tall, practically, as Rick. I do wish they'd been consistent about that. But yes, I was thinking, is this really better than the episodes I gave less than four to? The Enemy of My Enemy and Spring of Evil. And I thought, well, those two have more specifically wrong with them than this episode. This one does have quite a bit wrong with it, but it's not as wrong as The Enemy of My Enemy and Spring of Evil. And perhaps, yeah, it would be a three, but as I say in the review... The Alex fight stuff and the excellent voice work from Chris and a bit of interplay with a nook do make it go up to a four. As I say, I don't think a nook can carry this episode as the main villain. As I have said before, she's just Imhotep by another name and rather aimless and pointless and doesn't really add anything to the show. But it's a bit of a change to see Alex doing some cool flight moves with Anouk instead of Imhotep, so an extra point. It deserves it. And here we get to see the start of Alex doing some pretty exciting stuff, running up the wall there, jumping over the head of the giant obelisk creature and making it smash itself to pieces. That's good Alex stuff. Some manacle skills, some magi skills working in conjunction... He doesn't really use them in conjunction in this episode, of course. He uses one or the other at a time, and I have said before, it's rare to see them in conjunction. But we will in the next episode, Trio, as I've also said before. 
Rick and Anouk doing an impression there of the Velociraptors from the Lost World Jurassic Park with the roof tiles slipping out from under their feet and stuff. Yes, I've hardly mentioned this MacGuffin that Anouk has, the ring. And yeah, another MacGuffin-driven episode. Well, it's only to be expected by now. There was Alex using the manacle, independent of any Magi skills, but he used it to hit Anouk with a rock, which was quite cool. And it's gonna get cooler, the stuff Alex does over the next few minutes. And Chris really starts to come into his own here with his voice work. Again, he's sounding quite heroic, but overconfident and rather out of control. And Alex goes off to look for a nook on his own and leaves the others to the mercy of a nook's random bat creatures that have suddenly turned up. And yeah, this is great stuff from Chris, and they've been able to match up his face work and punching his palm like that in determination. Let's see how reckless she thinks I am when I bring down a nook. Smack the palm. Quite a lot of irony in that line, of course, but excellently said by Chris. And as I say, the animators have been able to make a lot of it to match his voice work and make a very complete, very compelling character, even when he's in a complete funk of being misused like he is now. He's still... At times, very stimulating Alex O'Connell. Mainly thanks to Chris. Again there, he does some excellent work with the manacle. Complete mastery of it now. On the cusp of being ready to use it for the final battle. As I keep saying, and as I keep hoping will happen. But every time I watch the DVD, it doesn't happen. Oh dear, Evie and Nook are absolutely addicted to this star fighting, aren't they? They have to do it every time they see each other. In whatever incarnation they're in. It's getting a bit old now. Another meaning there for the title, Old Friends. Jonathan has one of his anti-moments there. Although he might have got away with it if Evie hadn't blown his cover by saying, Jonathan! But who can tell? Of course, Rick, Evie and Jonathan are just around in this episode so that they can get aged, really. And here's a conversation between Alex and Rick that I don't like. It was in stark contrast, I thought, to that lovely conversation they had about their feelings when they were in New York in the baseball tunnel. And I thought, wow, what a really nice bit of character meshing that is between Alex and Rick. And I really believed in them as real characters, father and son, having a real relationship. But there, that horrible, generalised cliched conversation about we know you want to grow up and make your own decisions we know why you're a rebellious teenager we just care about you I thought well that's not really Rick and Alex saying that that's just general father and rebellious teenager having the same old conversation that we've seen in everything else and that's a bit of a shame because Rick and Alex is a great central relationship in this show and to see it used so badly and so cliched away I didn't enjoy that at all again Alex does some great manacle work there combining both manacle powers which I see Nahaberg and Shimin Rapidu I noticed in the last episode he only used Shimin Rapidu they didn't bother with which I see Nahaberg but he used which I see Naha back there to save Rick and Shimin Rapidu to get out himself, which was rather cool. And then he comes in and really starts to kick the crap out of a nook, kicks her in the face and she goes flying across the room, that's good stuff. Then they start to have a bit of a fight. This isn't their main fight, this isn't the really good bit with them. 
What does Anook say there? All the gods of the underworld could not defeat me, boy. What makes you think you can? Well, what do you think, Anook? He's Alex O'Connell. That's the decisive factor here. And Alex uses the manacle here in order to combat the power of the ring, which works pretty well. Nice bit of determination on Alex's face there before they go flying apart. And again, Chris does some really lovely voice work here, lying on the floor next to Evie and Jonathan. Mom, I'm sorry. I'm going to get us out of this. Really sincere. Again, that conviction that works so well in Chris's performance. So they match up with his face, his eyebrows, nice little half smile he does there. They couldn't do that without Chris laying the foundations with all his absolutely brilliant voice work. And here's the bit where Anouk randomly decides that she's going to be after the Manacle of Osiris. Ah, she says, with the Manacle of Osiris, I can really rule the world. And, oof, that ship has sailed, Anouk. The scrolls of Thebes are destroyed. Imhotep's been there, done all that many times before. You've missed the boat there. But it doesn't really come to anything. She doesn't mention the Manacle again. But here we go outside, and Alex and Anouk do have this rather decent fight that I do enjoy. Alex doing some great moves, and some manacle skills, I think. It's mainly great magi moves, this bit, which is good to see. Nice bit of jumping there. Oh, that may have been a slight combination. Well, he can actually run vertically all the way up that wall, can he? Okay. I think that's probably a manacle skill rather than a magi skill. All this jumping about's not bad, and that shot where they're both kind of flying through the air. Ooh, nice kick there from Alex. Sends a nook onto the roof. That flying shot reminds me of some sort of Japanese anime thing about man beasts and demons fighting for possession of the world or something. Not that I've seen many such productions as that, but that's what that kind of shot should be in, I think, rather than the Mummy cartoon. And that was one of Chris's absolutely brilliant deliveries when he was hanging off that spire and yelling to Anouk, Come on, Priestess, if you want to rule the world, you got to go through me first! Absolutely brilliant. Far more brilliant, a hundred times more brilliant than I said it there. And, well, Alex does look rather good in that position on his back, making that face... Puts all kinds of thoughts through one's mind. But of course he gets out of the situation by, once again, kicking a nook. Great stuff. And of course the nook's getting pretty confident here, but Alex has already formed this plan with Evie. Yes, of course, he can't do it all by himself, as ever. This reminds me much more favourably of earlier episodes. He needs that compelling family teamwork to save the day. And here's his compelling family with their reflective surfaces to beat Anuk once and for all. Well, certainly in this episode. And Alex does something here that he hasn't done for a while. He destroys a MacGuffin. He was building up quite a list of destroyed MacGuffins in the first season, but he's not done it for a bit. But there's another one to add to the list. He absolutely smifflicates that ring by smashing it with a rock. Great work, Alex. That was good to watch. And everyone gets their youth back, and Alex says, but how has Smashing the Ring managed to do that? And Evie's like, just don't worry about it, Alex, it makes quite enough sense for this 20-minute cartoon episode. And if it was something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where they talk too much as if they're in a cartoon series, Evie would actually have said that literally in that way. But she doesn't, she says it in an in-universe way. So that's all right. As I'd hoped, breaking the ring released all our life energy. I mean, that's more than we need to know, isn't it? And phew, it seems like Alex has finally learned that lesson in a really, really bad way, and he's out of his funk and ready to be at his absolute peak of manacle skills, magi skills, mental skills, emotional state in the next episode. And once again, Chris makes something out of a cheesy cartoon ending here. So does that mean I'm not grounded anymore? Absolutely fantastic. He can breathe life into any old piece of cheese and frequently does. 
So yeah, as I say, Chris Marquette, definitely the highlight of that one. Some steps on the journey of the whole series, but overall, an episode that deserves 4 out of 10, and an episode that I've given 4 out of 10. Hopefully you'll join me next time for a commentary on an episode that deserves 10 out of 10, and I have given 10 out of 10 my very favourite episode of all, Trio.